fellow frog fighters, Alexis here. I want to let you know that the video that you're about to watch was recorded between the United States and South Africa. And there are a couple times that the bandwidth dropped out just a little bit. So I want to apologize to you for that. But stick with it because the content is really great. Enjoy the show. Join me today as we talk with Jason Jaudan about aligning CFB skills to digital forensics. Frogcast. I'm your host, Alexis Bell, for a Frogcast. Today, we're talking with Jason Jadon about digital forensics. Hi, Jason. Hi, Alexis. How are you? Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. That's my pleasure. I know that um, for, for our viewers that don't know, um, Jason and I had met at an ACFE conference in Nashville. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, right. In Nashville, Tennessee. And um, so we had some time to talk there, and then we had uh, hours at the airport. <laughs> After that. It, it certainly made the, the sort of trip at the airport a lot easier having somebody to talk to. <laughs> exactly. And so we had a very interesting conversation um, sort of about this alignment between the certified fraud examiner skill set and aligning that to digital forensics. And I just thought that the, the conversation was meaningful and that was something that our viewers may be interested in. Um, so Jason, tell me a little bit about um, your background and sort of what your perspective is coming from. So um, I joined law enforcement in 1991 um, as a young detective. Uh, I joined uh, the division called the commercial branch. Um, effectively, it's the division of South African law enforcement that deals with all major white collar crime investigations and, and things like that. Um, and I did that for seven years before I transferred to our National Anti-Corruption Agency, where I eventually ended up leaving as the head of our cyber forensics laboratory. So I've had 24 odd years experience doing investigations, catching bad guys, which I must be honest, uh, my little confession, it's something I really, really like to do. Um, <laughs> catching bad guys really, <laughs> really makes me happy. Um, and you know, so during, you know, as a, as a white collar crime investigator, as a detective, um, a lot more of our cases started to come into the lab and with me being the, well, into the, the agency and with me being kind of the resident nerd um, that was good with computers and liked to play with, you know, play video games and things like that. If it had any with a computer, I was the detective that ended up getting it. And this was sort of the early 1990s when digital forensics was really starting to develop worldwide. Um, you know, and we were operating very much in isolation. The internet wasn't what it is now. You know, occasionally we would have some connection with the FBI through the legal attaché's office and there'd be some rudimentary training going backwards and forwards. But it was only in, I think it was 1999 that I actually did my first formal digital forensics training. And that was... Um, at the FBI Academy in Quantic. So, you know, from that point of view, you know, onwards I've done numerous training courses in digital forensics. Um, I teach digital forensics around the world. Um, I now own my own practice doing digital forensics, but I'm also a certified fraud examiner. So I, my background is I've been able to combine the investigative skills of a detective with the digital forensics and computer skills of a full-blown nerd and geek. Um, and that's pretty good. I mean, my, my tagline in the police is I was a geek with a gun and, and that really worked well for me. <laughs> Outstanding. So I know that um, if I think back in, in sort of my early days, um, we sort of had the digital forensics team was separate from the forensic accounting team. Um, and I, I sort of became the liaison between the two. Um, yeah. So I felt if I was leading a really big case, I needed to understand, well, what are those guys capable of doing? Because it was the data that was coming from imaging those drives that would come to us and then we would analyze it. But I thought, well, maybe I'm missing things and I need to understand what is possible, um, what do they have access to so that we know what to, to analyze. So. Um, you know, I think that being a single person, you know, one person that has um, the foot in both sides of those camps, then that really gives you a unique perspective. 
Well, that's one of the things that we've picked up, you know, so um, you'll, you'll find even in the United States, a lot of the people that were in the pioneering, you know, the pioneers in digital forensics were normal police detectives, you know, working narcotics or, or you know, uh, white collar crime cases, fraud squads and things along those lines. You know, again, guys and women similar to me that were just geeks that like catching bears. Um, but somewhere along in the development of, of, of digital forensics, there were a lot of people coming into the digital forensics domain that were just IT people. Mm. Um, they understood IT, but they didn't understand investigations. They didn't understand law. But then on the other hand, you had the investigators and the fraud examiners and the forensic accountants and that coming in that didn't understand the IT part. And, and we created this, this really, well, I think it's a very bad situation where it, it, this is what the traditional forensic process then started to look like. Investigators would task the digital forensics guys, go and image those computers, go process them. Oh, and, and here's a list of keywords that just give me everything that has a keyword match. And then the analysis would then be done by the investigators. But the problem with that is, is that there is so much more around an, an, a computer environment, uh, operating system, how the application, how everything interacts, that me just finding an email, for example, doesn't tell me the full story. So, so as, the, as the digital forensics person, you really need to understand that case. So the investigator becomes your client and you have to be invested in that, in your client's case effectively. And it's the role of the digital forensics examiner to actually give you the optimal evidence that you need in your case, because sometimes it's the evidence that you don't even think of asking about because the investigator is not aware of what the system is. So to give an example, this is a horrible confession to make. Um, I'm a guy, I suck at cars. Um, I can put the gas in and I can switch the car on and I can change the tire. Don't ask you to work on an engine because there'll probably be more parts left over than <laughs> But that's often very true with the digital forensic stuff as well. Um, a lot of people think if, if you just give me the data analyze, that's solving the case, but they don't, they're not aware of how everything fits together. Um, and, and that's where we need to see a, a joining, not, not necessarily of digital forensics people being investigators, investigators being digital forensics people, but we need to have a, a coming together, a, a sharing of minds to a sense where they both understand and the needs and the, the, the um, capabilities of the other so that you could actually give an enhanced product at the end of the day. And I think that's something we don't do very well. Um, you know, it's easy for me to turn around and say, oh, it's something what I've seen, you know, just working locally in South Africa and other parts of Africa. But having investigations around the world, that's what I've seen in other countries as well. Um, and it happens in big agencies. Um, it happens in big corporations. And invariably what you end up happening is um, almost like a dislike between the two disciplines developing where the investigators turn around to the forensic guy, you know, the computer forensic guys and saying, I, mean, I really don't know what value you give me because I, I gave you a keyword list and you give me 20 million documents and when the heck do you think I'm going to go through all these 20 million documents? Um, and then you've got the computer forensic guy saying, but this person doesn't know anything about computers. Why are they asking me for all the stuff that obviously makes no sense? So, so somewhere along the line, we need to bring these two together. And that's where I found that having digital forensics practitioners that have good investigation skill sets that understand investigations that understand how to build cases understand how to co co sort of collaborate with other other parties in a project environment or in a team environment and also understand the legal issues actually allows them to play a far more valuable role in the investigation and and that's what i think we're lacking at the moment that's an excellent point. I think that you're right, especially in the early days, um, it was, you know, here's the keywords that I want. Um, but I, I think that the best investigations that we had um, was sitting everybody down together and getting them to understand these are the outcomes that we're after, right? Mm. We're interested in, for example, linking relationships between, you know, actors inside of this case. You know, this person is linked to this person is linked to this person in these particular ways. Yeah. Uh, I think if you can help the, the digital forensics um, experts understand what, you're, what outcome you're after, then they can help you craft the best way to go and get that information, right? Yeah. Uh, 
I think it, it reminds me of uh, a case where, um, uh, you know, I, I started going to um, uh, conferences for digital forensics, not knowing the first thing in the world about it, because I knew there was so much I needed to, to, to understand. 95% uh, of it was going right over my head. I just didn't get it. But over the years, I started to understand it more and more. And I remember sitting in a training and uh, I learned that on this particular device, there were seven different tables that were tracking GPS location. And I thought, ding, 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 here we go. Absolutely, this is what I need. I needed to be able to, for that case to prove that that person was at that location. And maybe I couldn't prove they were there, but I could prove that their device was there. And so just understanding what's, what's possible um, and it really, that was when we started bringing the digital forensics guys into the conversation when we were designing, um, yeah. what are we going after? What do we need to look for? What do we need to prove for this case? And you know, yeah. it's, it's an iterative process, right? As you get more information, yeah. Bayesian statistics, right? That everything changes now, you have new information. So maybe you're yeah. going in a different direction. So keep them engaged in that conversation so that you get a more robust um, um, uh, you know, evidence for your case. And, okay. and then it cuts down on the unnecessary things. I have been one of those people in the cold room with the jacket and the Kleenex and just looking at email after email till your eyes bleed. And it's a horrible experience. So if you can make it more efficient um, mm -hmm. by everybody designing what that looks like together, then I, I think you're in a better spot. Yeah. I agree. I mean, if, if you look at, you know, some of the processes that are relevant now, you know, a traditional digital forensics examination could easily take you a week or two weeks on a single computer because literally the guy was pushing all the buttons running all the keyword searches um, but now when you start to integrate the processes that the digital forensics person knows exactly what the case is about how to build the case what kind of evidence is relevant you can reduce those processing times to three or four days and i mean we've had amazing turnarounds like that where we've literally been able to go and say Here's the spoken gun you need to prove your case. And so people say, but how did you get it that quickly? Well, we knew exactly what you needed to do. We knew exactly what you needed to prove in the case. We understood the legal elements that needed to be proven. And we found the evidence that matched those. Things. You know, there's your case. Um, we, did a, we did a recent investigation for a major financial service provider in, in the insurance industry. And um, they had used other service providers and who had sort of followed this traditional approach. And they were very skeptical that, you know, they wanted to try somebody new and they brought us on board. And literally within four days, we produced, you know, our sworn affidavit with all the evidence. And you know, the, our client looked at it and said, but is this what we were supposed to be getting all along? I'm like, well, yes, that's <laughs> what real forensics is about. And, and literally, the case went like that with a few more additional affidavits from their side of the investigation, went to the police, the police got an arrest warrant for the suspect, arrested the person, went to court, he saw the evidence against him, cleared out, plea bargained, and, you know, got a six-month um, six jail, jail term. Um, I think that's efficient. Um, as opposed to, we could have done the normal process, given the investigator hundreds of thousands of documents. It would have taken him six months to work through it. He would have got irritated with us. You know, you're just the same as everybody else. And that guy might still be walking, you know, still might be employed by that organization now. And he's not. And I think that's the difference. We've got to start doing things differently. We've got to think smarter. I think you're absolutely right. Imagine the cost reduction for the clients. You know, I've been in some of those cases where um, between my team and the uh, attorneys that were assigned to just the e-discovery, just going through the e-discovery, 30 people. So 30 people times whatever that hourly rate was, you know, that's the cost. And for just that process alone. So if you can cut that down to something, you know, minimal, then yeah. I think that the it's much better for the client. Um, but I'd like to go back to your point about uh, the legal elements. You know, yeah. that if we think through a, a case, um, right, as a certified fraud examiner, we're always uh, thinking that, you know, we have to prove this in court. Our entire process yeah. is, is forensically sound so that by the time we get to court, everything, we can just present that, right? Yeah, that's correct. So on the digital forensic side, if you have uh, examiners that understand that legal element, what is required for us to be able to prove that in court, then yeah. that's half your battle right there. Exactly. I, I think that's an excellent point. You know, we, we've seen a lot of benefit from it. And, and look, to a large extent, I still find prosecutors and judges and, and defense lawyers and civil lawyers 
that struggled to understand some of the nuances of digital, you know, digital evidence. So we spend a lot of time actually educating the legal fraternity. So I'll often do engagements with our law society, um, you know, speaking to attorneys, uh, speaking to lawyers, speaking to prosecutors, you know, training judges, because at the end of the day, those are the people that are going to evaluate that evidence. But it's also been a benefit for us because we better understood legal practitioners need to prove their cases in court so the advantage of that is we've been able to take that expertise and when we're doing our investigations our, our digital forensic investigations we can identify evidence we know will help actually prove certain elements so for example if one of the elements in the case let's take a typical fraud investigation um, uh, in South Africa, we use a common law definition for, for uh, fraud. So it's an unlawful and intentional misrepresentation that causes prejudice or potential prejudice. Now, in most fraud investigations, the investigator finds the thing that was the misrepresentation, whether it's a document or an email or, you know, words, whatever it is, they'll find that. And then they find the misrepresentation, they link it to the person, and then they show that that misrepresentation was the causal link to the, the financial loss or the prejudice that the victim suffered. Right? How do we prove intention? Intention in most crimes is a very subjective thing. It's not like there's some objective piece of evidence that's out there. But again, from a digital forensics point of view, we can develop that objective intention. So I'll come back, you know, obviously being a fraud examiner, we all know the fraud trial, you know, I'll come back to the fraud triangle and I'll look at things like opportunity, rationalization, and I'll be going through that individual's computer or smartphone or their iPad to look for those kind of elements that help show intention. You know, so if somebody's engaged in, um, fraud and and they on their computer they've been sitting on their web browser tried to look at how do i move money out of the country that or how can i avoid um paying taxes for the irs or, or whatever that's kind of what we call a clue um <laughs> and, and and a lot of digital forensics a lot, a lot of investigators miss that from digital forensics because they don't think about it and, and that's where having that understanding of the law is so critical because now you're not finding evidence just to to satisfy what an investigator wants you to find you satisfying evidence that ultimately the investigator needs to prove their case in court mm -hmm. and so we in a sense can also become a bridge between the investigators and the legal practitioners at the end of the day Outstanding. Um, you know that uh, the Netherlands is often referred to as the most connected yeah. country in the world. And so they really are the leaders in, in sort of all things digital, um, right? Uh, at least that's their reputation. And so I know that one of the things that they do is they have people that their job is to educate judges and prosecutors yeah. about digital forensics, um, yeah. but it's a formalized process. Um, and so you mentioned that you're doing that as, yeah. as your firm, but um, what would it be like if it was a formalized process um, across the board? You know, how would that help? Yeah. The so, so ironically, I can actually comment on the Netherlands example because okay. I, I, I'm actually an assessor for the Netherlands Department of Justice that runs this program. Um, the Netherlands Department of Justice has this program called the Netherlands Register of Court Experts. So it's a regulatory framework um, not just for digital forensics, but for a number of the other forensic sciences as well, DNA, yeah. ballistic, and so forth. And, and part of the regulator's responsibility is, is educational. So it's educating the legal fraternity and the judges about different forms of forensic evidence and how to evaluate it. But the other part of this framework, which is which I find very exciting, is that you may not testify as an expert in a Dutch court in a forensic science discipline if you haven't been assessed and recognized or registered by this um, regulatory body. Um, so, you know, if, again, if I think about from a U.S. perspective, if I'm going to testify in a U.S. court, I've got to do my whole, um, you know, my evidence in chief where I've got to qualify as an expert. I've got to meet all the Dorbert and Fry standards and, and all those type of things. That doesn't exist in the Netherlands. It literally is, are you registered here? Yes. Where's your registration? Okay, you're an expert. Bam, <laughs> that's it. The, the judge knows that that person meets the necessary standards. 
um, and knows how to test that person against those standards. So it's a, it's a quite it's a nice system, and and I think if I look across the board, we probably need more education worldwide in the judiciary and in the legal fraternity about what digital evidence is and how digital forensics works. Um, the reason for that being is because there are a lot of um, people out there that are like to refer to as dabbling in digital forensics. Mm. Um, are not really qualified and because to a large extent the discipline is still fairly new in in legal terms i mean we've only been really doing it for about 20 years we're still in that position where bad case law could be set um and that can have a precedent effect on all digital forensics so could you imagine you know in the u.s supreme court there's a piece of case law that gets handed down around the admissibility of digital evidence um for example and that could fundamentally change digital evidence throughout the entire United States. Um, right. And of course, perhaps the United States will guarantee it will filter down to the rest of the world as well <laughs> because that's how it works. So, so I think it's very important that we have these kind of educational conversations. And, and it, for me, it's, it's very important that these educational conversations have to be more than just about a firm or a practice or a person. It's about building a community and it's about making things better. So, you know, it's very important for me at a personal level that we should do this education, not because you're getting paid for it. And a lot of the stuff that we don't get paid for because, you know, the departments don't have funds for, but it's important to do it because at the end of the day, I believe very strongly there is a human being's life at the end of the line on the work that I do. Um, if I do really, really bad work or I make a really fundamental mistake, I can put an innocent person in jail, or my work could be responsible for putting an innocent person in jail. But on the other side, my work might be so substandard that a bad guy or a bad girl who should go to jail doesn't go to jail and continues to offend. Um, and I know while most of my cases in my career have been white collar crime cases and crime cases and hacking cases, I don't know if I could really live with myself if that was in a pedophile case or some kind of kiddie porn case that you let that kind of person get out. So, yeah, it, I think we do have a responsibility to educate others and it's a global responsibility. It's not, it, we need to share our information. Absolutely. I, I know that that was one of the things that you and I talked about sort of at length at the airport was, you know, this, this idea that, um, you know, you and I both own our own consulting firms and um, consultants have generally, you know, across the board uh, wanted to hold information because that's what's proprietary to them and that's what they're making their money on. That's yeah. what makes them the differentiator between the next consulting firm. Um, yeah. And that goes true for the small people like us and then all the way, you know, the really big firms. Um, mm. But I think that, that that's a mistake. I think that there are things that we need to be able to share with each other. Obviously, if it's, uh, you know, uh, trade secrets or something like that, keep that to yourself. But there's so much information that we have in our heads from 20 and 30 years of doing this kind of work that I feel like you, that we have an obligation to share that. Yeah. Um, and, and whether that's, you know, sharing that with law enforcement, with other certified fraud examiners, digital forensics, um, academia, uh, you know, you and I have talked a lot about academia and sort of, yeah. um, having those conversations about driving research that's relevant to the practitioners um, that takes conversations and that takes being able to share knowledge to be able to to drive that kind of direction mm -hmm. so i think that um, we absolutely we have an obligation to do that as a community and and that's one of the reasons i wanted to bring you onto the show because um you know i think that that's that's something that i admire about your work that consistently throughout your career that's something that you've just done you've been that beacon for sharing of knowledge and and i just think it's critical I, you know i i mean one of the things for me is very important especially around this collaborative and and this is something i often used to say um when i was still in still working in law enforcement is how often did we talk about organized crime all the time we talked about organized crime we never ever once spoke about organized law enforcement um, we have agencies that don't talk to each other. We have agencies that don't share information. We've got political turf wars. Um, you know, and if that's happening in government, it's happening equally in the private sector. I, I spoke at a, a big conference, a big um, cybersecurity conference a few years ago. And the topic of my, of my talk my note was around 
you know, organized cybercrime. And I actually said to this audience that, you know, um, a lot of the people sitting in the audience, as far as I'm concerned, are accessories after the fact of cybercrime. And of course, they were very offended by what I had to say. But I said, you know what, you need to understand that if you have information about an attack and you hold that intelligence, that information that you've got, because you would rather have the bad guys then go and attack your competitors and you think that somehow holding onto that information gives you a competitive advantage, all you've done is emboldened that attacker to learn more that when they come back the next time, they're going to be far stronger, far more educated and far more lethal. And when, when I said that, people said, oh, you know, we never thought about it that way. And, and that's the problem. Um, yes, our information, you know, people retain our services for our skills and our expertise. But do I want to hold on to the same skills and expertise for the last 30 years? I mean, could you imagine if I was still investigating cases the way I did as a young police constable, you know, detective constable 25 odd years ago? Um, I would be a really useless investigator because things have changed. We've moved on. And, and I think I, 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 I'm a big fan of Bruce Lee and Eastern philosophy and, and things along those lines. And, you know, I always remember the story about, you know, the Zen master who's talking to his student and he says, you know, uh, when the student comes and says, I want to learn everything. And the master sort of, sort of gives him a cup of tea and he starts pouring until the tea starts and he just carries on pouring. And the master says, well, um, well, the student says, but master, it's overflowing. You must stop. But the boss says, you like this teacup. You're full with your own ideas and you keep on pouring. I have a, an alternative interpretation to that. If my cup is full, I've got, I've got nothing for new knowledge to, to come in. So I empty my cup by sharing my knowledge with others. Mm. And I now have space to learn new things. For me, that's driven my innovation. If I had stayed doing digital forensics the way I had learned to do it 20 years ago, I never would have developed. We never would have evolved. We never would be doing things differently. So for me, emptying my cup periodically to share my knowledge and expertise with other people allows me to fill it up again with new knowledge. I don't lose the old knowledge because it's out there and it's part of who I am. It's part of my DNA but it forces me to innovate. And I think innovation is very important in what we do. You know, if you think about it, going back to your organized crime uh, comments, they are organized. They work with each other and they are organized and we need to be more organized and working together and collaboration, collaborating more because otherwise they're gonna be ahead of us and that's just unacceptable. I mean, just to, to sort of support that, in, if you look at most corporate environments, they're incredibly silo-based. I mean, you can tell me what you want to about new management styles, the, the silos. <laughs> still, <laughs> they do, they exist. <laughs> um, they are there. People don't share information. People hold on to information for power within corporations. Um, they're really bad at sharing information. Um, and with cyber criminals and, and the other criminals out there are really good is they don't have the same constraints. They share information really, really well. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if um, I know that, you know, company X is vulnerable and has poor security, I'm going to tell everybody that I know this company X is vulnerable and has poor security if I'm a bad guy. Right. Um, because that's how that community works. Um, we need to be more like them. I'm not saying we should do bad things, but we should have the feeding our fellow practitioners and our fellow professionals that we can share with each other. Uh, yeah, you know, that reminded me, um, a lifetime ago, I did my internship at the um, Syracuse Police Department in New York, in yeah. their fraud unit, and um, one of the things that I learned um, from the digital forensic guys there was that um, when people found a vulnerability in, in a company's um, systems, they would go outside the building on the sidewalk and write in chalk a yeah that represented what those yeah. vulnerabilities were. I mean, this is yeah. a very long time ago, obviously. Yeah. But even back then, even way back then, in such a manual way, they were communicating and in, in a way that, you know, other people would just walk by on the sidewalk and not have any idea what that meant. Exactly. And, and it's right there, plain sight, bam. Yeah. Exactly, I and mean, it's scary. Yeah, and they've always done that. And I think you're right. I think that if we want to level set 
and you know level that playing field we absolutely have to collaborate with each other exactly I mean, here's my viewpoint in life i don't care who takes credit um you know at the end of the day i'm happy with who i am inside um but do i make the world a better place by making sure a bad guy gets justice or a bad girl gets justice then i'm happy i don't care who takes the credit you know, you, if you in this, if you in this line of work, because you want to be in the spotlight, you want to walk down the red carpet, you should take up a career in acting because that's not <laughs> what happens in our line of work. <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> you know, the, the closest, the closest I get to the spotlight is keynoting at a conference, you know, <laughs> as much as I'm ever going to get. Yeah. You know, you're right. They're not making a movie about my life. You're absolutely right. Although well, I'm I think, I think I know who should play me in the movie, but you know, nobody's making a movie about me. <laughs> yeah, I, I have my ideas, but I think Richard Gere is probably <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Well, listen, um, Jason, it has been a pleasure um, having you on the show. Are there any last thoughts that you want to leave with us before we go? Um, I think the last thought is, again, just coming back to the original discussion around digital forensics is, you can't do an investigation in the modern era without relying on digital forensics. Um, you know, I, I remember reading a study, I think it was Stanford or Yale, you know, uh, I can't remember the exact, it's something like 90% of all human knowledge is now electronic. Mm. Um, we creating more electronic information, you know, in, in a year than we've created so far in the whole of human history. So if we're not using digital forensics in our investigations, how competent are we as, as investigators and fraud examiners? Um, you know, I, as, a, as a certified fraud examiner, you would know as well, we, we bound by our code of ethics and code of conduct and uh, our professional standards. And one of those requires us to be competent investigators if we're doing an investigation. So how competent are we if we don't use all of the resources at our disposal? Um, but to use that effectively, we need to understand the digital forensics world and we need to get digital forensics people who understand the fraud examiner's world as well. Do you have recommendations for uh, financial investigators that are interested in learning more about digital forensics? Not so much to do it, but to be able to understand it so that they can better do their investigation? There's, there's, there's a number of, um, of uh, book, you know, really good books out there, sort of easy to read books um, out there. Um, I, what I can do is uh, sort of I'll send you a list of references and you can put it in the show notes or okay. <laughs> something along those lines. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, just going and even speaking to, to Ford examiners, uh, we've got, you know, there's a lovely advantage now with these uh, uh, online campuses, these, these MOOCs um, that are out there to do courses in basic digital forensics. Uh, I've seen a few really good ones that are, you know, free um, or I think most expense was like a hundred dollars or something like that is really quite cheap um, and they're fine if you want to just get a, a good sense of understanding I, I actually did one over December on forensic engineering not that I'm a forensic engineer but sometimes our work intersects with the work of forensic engineers so understanding their world makes me better able to operate in that world so um, there, there, there are no elements to knowledge if you want to learn the stuff is out there Outstanding. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Well, I am so glad that you came on the show. Um, thank you for being a fellow fraud fighter. Pleasure. Okay. Thank you, um, fraud fighters, and we will see you on the next show. To find out more about Jason and his firm, go to dfirlabs.com.